Are you anti-plot, against plot, um, in the middle? So I'm definitely not against plot. I wrote sitcom for 25 years. It's all about plot. Advert breaks happen at certain times. You need to have certain things happen at certain places to motivate the advert breaks. Um, interestingly enough, now though, with television not having so many advert breaks, you know, with Netflix where you it's on demand and so you don't you know don't have your advert breaks. I think I do think plot's changing slightly. The three act structure and the terminology around the three act structure that's developed over the years. Um, it's really useful after you've written something. I find, um, and I I just can't get this out of my head, but for me it feels like human beings have been telling stories for thousands of years before we've been analyzing them. So like we told stories naturally around the campfires. You know, we told stories about the hunt, about where to find the animals. There was some sort of structure in that in a way. Yes, there was a main character trying to find an animal and there was following clues. And so there was some sort of a structure already to that, which is maybe a universal myth, I'm not sure. But we've been telling stories for a long time, longer than we've been analyzing stories. So for me, plot um, and the analysis of plot can be a real um, source of people getting stuck in their writing because they feel that they need to have a plot that works before they write. Now, if you just write without a plot, you can also end up down a dark hole of loose ends that you know lead nowhere and just write for the rest of your life without having a structure. But I find plot and the analysis of plot um, a good place to be once you've written something. But for me, plot arises out of characters in a space doing something and that creates the plot the characters themselves are almost uh it's like this whole separation of character and plot is is not actually real when you're either creating it or watching it character and plot are intrinsically linked um we separate them in order to analyze and maybe in the rewrite write our stories better but i do find that so if you just focus on plot and drop the characters um it can result in stories that are feel a bit empty um, and it can result in stories that everyone's written before. What I find really funny about these books on plot um, and some really good books are written on plot and I point to them in my book. I don't talk about plot at all in my book. What I find really funny about books on plot is they'll say these seven beats need to be in a story. They don't have to be there in that order. They don't all have to be there. And I'm like, what do you mean? They don't have to be there in that order. They don't all have to be there. This is kind of, it's like a weird, I don't know if you've read close to these books, they've all got this disclaimer of like, you know, they don't have to be in that order and they don't have to necessarily all be there. And I'm like, well, what are you really trying to say? So I'm slightly suspicious of generating your idea writing from plot first. I think it can be really useful in the rewrite. It's definitely really useful in the story edit. I use it all the time when I'm trying to help writers strengthen, the, strengthen their stories. But actually, the best bit on plot that I've ever heard, the best quote on plot, and it's not even about plot, it's from that book on filmmaking that I mentioned earlier by Alexander McKendrick. He says something like, the only thing you need to know, what's happening now in your story should not be as exciting or uh, interesting as what may or may not happen later. It's really simple. Oh, wow. What is happening now shouldn't be as Interesting or exciting as what may or may not happen later. So something's happening later and it's drawing the story forward. And it's that thing that's happening later that you need to put in your plot somewhere. So we need to know that something's going to happen in the, you know, you need to set it up so that something's going to pay off and that'll drive the story forward and that'll keep people watching. But I like that because it's kind of an escapist, you know, it's not really about plot, but it's kind of linked to structure in some way. So yeah, I, I'm not anti-plot, but... Um, as a matter of fact, I'm pro-plot when it comes to analysis of the story and trying to make it stronger. Because I do believe you have to take a sledgehammer to your story once you've written it and hit it. And if it breaks, something's wrong with the structure. And so you need to like make it work. Um, but I sometimes find that a lot of the... Even when people use plot to analyze movies, they try and identify like the inciting incident and they do it in the same movie and they identify different places. And I'm like, what is this? It's not an exact science. I think... Writing isn't an exact science and people who claim that it's an exact science are actually lying. In my experience of writing is it's not an exact science. It's, uh, it's a bit different to that. And so, yeah, so I, I kind of worry about the usefulness of extremely plot-driven writing books. They can be useful for some people in some places and I wrote from that for a lot of my life. What is taking a sledgehammer to your story though? Like how do you metaphorically do that? So yeah, I always think of it like this. Um, when I 
when you write from a character-driven sort of perspective or from a, maybe a more organic perspective, you tentatively connect scenes together to form a sort of like a structure. And it can be a very fragile, crystalline structure. <laughs> it might not be very strong. And taking a sledgehammer to it means asking yourself those really hard questions that structure sort of asks you to ask in a way is like, what is your character want now and have you told us it early enough you know and you hit it and it's like oh if it survives it survives or um when is the transition into the new world or when is our transition into the second act is that strong enough is it clear enough that's another so these are the kind of taking a sledgehammer to your story and if it falls apart then mm, it's probably not strong enough but if it's really crystalline strong enough structure and it holds then maybe your story is good enough. That's kind of what I meant by taking a sledgehammer. It's all those difficult questions that story execs will ask you, or you know, um, people who read lots of books will ask you. And 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 I think I think we we do have to do that. We can't be precious about our stories either, even though they these for me they can be really beautiful creations that come out of a place of good intention. At some point, they're gonna that you know your audience is gonna hit sledgehammers at it. And does it hold? Does it not hold? Yeah, you have to. You have to put it through the ringer a bit. That's when you bring in Robert McKee. They do that with screenwriting videos too, trust yeah. me. <laughs> no, they do. I know, it's hilarious. I wonder sometimes how useful they are. Um, they may be useful. Um, I definitely came from that position in the beginning when I, was, when I first taught, um, definitely. I was all like, you know, um, what are you doing? This is ridiculous. It was just like the sort of, but there's an anger around that sometimes and I wonder about that. I actually do question where that's coming from. Where is this sort of anger towards story? Um, so I was coming from a place of insecurity because I, I didn't really, you know, I hadn't written much. I was like, you know, and I was like, oh my God, these students, what am I going to do? I'll be strict because if I'm strict, then they'll listen to me. And I've changed now. I'm a lot more softer and I'm a lot more nurturing in the way that I help people their stories into the world as opposed to you know try and kill them as they arrive so yeah <laughs> yeah I suppose I am I am actually suspect of um, of where that the intention is coming from in the in the shouty story people that can shout at people you know the drill master story guy I'm like ah, I don't know it seems to be coming from a misled place it's just like I'm like the scene in Forrest oh, Gump. This is my first interview in LA and I'm gonna get kicked out of the town. No, you know, no, no. Like the scene in Forrest Gump. Gump! You know, and he's like right in his face and he's like, yeah. what is story? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just... That is a great skit. Oh my God, I'm gonna do that. That is genius. Resonance. That's mm, your first chapter? Yeah. Mm. What, tell us what that's about. So resonance for me is, um, I have a quote in that chapter. My book's got quotes in every chapter so I'll have a lot of quotes in this interview but I have a quote in that chapter that begins with which is this it is it's a complicated quote and it might not be easily to understand easy to understand just saying it but it's a quote from Gustave Flaubert uh, Madame Bovary and the quote is um, uh, something like language is a cracked kettle on which we beat out tunes for bears to dance to while all the while we long to move the stars to pity. So it means language is, we want to move the stars to pity with our language. We want our language to be this beautiful thing that expresses everything we're feeling and expresses our emotions. But actually language is a cracked kettle on which we're beating our tunes for bears to dance to. I don't know why bears are dancing, but it's like a language fails us when it comes to certain things, I really believe. I think certain things like religion and faith, language fails us and logic fails us at that point. And I also believe that with creation, when we create things, language fails us to really explain what's going on at the core of creativity and that moment of creativity, which is kind of what my book's about. So my little caveat is always with the word resonance. The word resonance came out of an inability to explain what happens to me when I'm watching a movie and I'm moved, or when I'm looking at a painting and I'm moved, or when I'm listening to a piece of music and I'm moved. I use the word resonance there because for me it feels like something in the painting is vibrating and it vibrates something in me and I resonate with it. And that's what I mean by resonance is I, I look at a painting, like for example, I, yeah, I look at a painting, for example, in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. There's this one particular painting that I saw, uh, Wheat Field with Crows, which is a beautiful painting and it's just really moved. When I was in the museum looking at this painting, it really moved me and resonated with me in a really deep way. 
Um, I hope it wasn't because I was in Amsterdam and things can move you there, which shouldn't. But um, I'm sure it wasn't that. Uh, but other things move me. You know, paintings and moments in movies move me, particularly music will move me. Characters behaving in a certain way will move me. And that movement and that resonance is what I'm trying to create um, in the scripts that my writers are, are writing is how do we take that resonance how do we make our audience, in reading a script, never mind watching it, but how do we make that them resonate with what's on the page? That for me is, is the real trick of writing. Um, and I do believe we're doing, we do that by doing what Hemingway says we do, which is, um, it's very easy. You just sit at the typewriter and bleed. <laughs> you know, we take our memory well. We put it on the stage. We put our pint of blood on the stage. And that's what the way we create resonance, because if it moved us in our memories, if it stayed in our memories for some way, so for some reason, it might have had a resonance. It might have this charge that we then put on the page and then people reading it resonate with it. So that's kind of what I mean by resonance. Of course, it can get really complicated because you do need structure sometimes to get to that point where people are moved. You know, you need to have certain things in place so that the, you know, you, we care about the character so that when they do something, we're moved by it. But I still believe that there are certain um, sort of events in our lives even uh, objects and um, senses and sounds and touches and tastes, which if we take from our memory, they, have, they carry this weight of resonance. You put them on the page and there it is. And it's a, it's a, it's a difficult thing to, uh, to do consciously, but you can. Um, and it's also difficult to, to kind of talk about because it's so abstract, but you recognize it immediately when you see it. I mean, I know you know what I'm talking about, but it's difficult to kind of do it except by accessing your memories and being very vulnerable. It's also about being vulnerable, I think, and putting yourself out there. You're some, some of your vulnerability and then people will resonate with it, I think. Because if it's too much of just your own vulnerability, it becomes a manifesto exactly. without the structure. Exactly. Uh -huh. This is where, you know, what I always say is like, I don't want this book, I don't want to hear about your life. Your boring life, because I actually don't. I want to hear about something else, maybe. You know, I don't want to just read about your life. I want to read about, I want aspects of your life to be present in the story you're telling. And that's different. The story you're telling is a story. It should have structure. It should have, you know, and it, but, but you put your memories in there, your aspects of it, and then it really starts to come alive. And uh, just to kind of go back to the uh, story structure thing, maybe, uh, and back to that Van Gogh painting, because I love that Van Gogh painting. I always use an example because I know, I don't know what Van Gogh was doing when he painted, but I know that he didn't have a test audience and he didn't read a book on screenwriting theory. And he didn't put his painting up and say to everyone, right guys, look at this painting. Are there enough crows in this painting? We deal with crows. Are the, are the, do you want more yellow? And then hand out fly, you know, forms and then the audience all filled it in and then like handed it back to him and he changed it. So that didn't happen. So he was doing something else, which I think is he was resonating and he was just moving with emotion. He put that on the canvas. Now, of course, he didn't have to pay millions of dollars for that canvas, which is why you need maybe audience test subjects to give you, you know, see if your movie's working or not. But uh, if, if you write from a position of, okay, I've got to please an audience. I've got to make money out of this. And uh, let me read a book on structure. I don't know if you hit the resonance. Not always. <laughs>